All right, everyone, we have a couple of now polls uh, that are new enough to analyze. We have enough data now. We have a little bit, we have a new poll out of New Hampshire. I already analyzed that, but I will talk about it in brief for people who didn't hear it. Uh, we got to look at the 2020 primaries for the Democratic Party. Of course, it, this we've got an incumbent election, so there's no real polling to look at for the Republicans. Trump is the nominee. I mean, he will be the candidate unless he keels over or is impeached, and the latter is not particularly likely. The former, it's more likely that he would have a heart attack with his next Big Mac than that he's going to drop because of impeachment or something. It'd be funny to see what would happen if Mike Pence were the candidate, since he would be the presumptive nominee same day. Oh, I guarantee there'd be a packed field of people trying to nip at his ankles. Can you imagine a President Pence? How funny that'd be. Might as well just Bush 3.0. Anyway, we got to talk about these polls. We have an Economist poll and a Fox News poll. Now... Fox News is okay with accuracy with regards to these polls. They have been riding close to the aggregate for a while. It's when they conduct a, a Trump approval poll that you have to question things a little more. But when they're looking at the Democratic field, you, the people think that a Fox News poll means that they're like polling Bill O'Reilly's old audience or something. That's not how, that's not the methodology. It's more of a standard polling firm as far as that goes. So don't worry too much about the sampling. Now, Economist, YouGov. I tend to trust more than most. They've been spookily accurate, accurate uh, in several elections in a row, the last midterms, prior to that 2016, prior to that the midterms, and indeed in 2012, YouGov has done well, which is funny because initially I think people questioned their methodology. They've got Biden in the lead at 23, which is considerably below the aggregate. This may be an outlier, keep that in mind. Warren at 20, so just right up behind him. Uh, Sanders at 16, Harris at 8, rounding them out, Buttigieg at gets 6, and then you have O'Rourke, another outlier possibly at 5, and then the rest of the field. So you would cut things off, the top 6 candidates are viable. With Fox, you have Biden on 31. I think, I, I believe that with The Economist, you also have a don't know or other category, and that this is why it doesn't add up to 100. With Fox, I don't think they have that. They've got Biden at 31, they've got uh, Warren at 20, Sanders at 10, Harris at 8, which is the same as YouGov, and then Buttigieg at 3, O'Rourke at 2, and they've actually got Booker and Yang both at 3, so they would be sort of in that technically viable echelon of the field. If you look at the aggregates, they're largely unchanged. The one thing that has remained the same is what I predicted over a month ago, which is Kamala Harris' fall from grace. She's now down in the mid to high uh, single digits. She's no longer particularly competitive. You haven't heard a lot about her. That's because the only reason that she rose up was because a good debate performance allowed the legacy media to crow about a, a woman of color who did well at the first debate. It gave them their fluff stories, their, their hit pieces on Trump. It allowed her to rise up to the mid-teens, but it was too precipitous a rise. That is, if you looked at the, at the peak that she was at, she, when she began to level off, she was never going to go higher than that. She never built a hardened core of support. She's back down at, I think uh, if I look at this, just visually speaking, She's down at her long-term average, which was around 7 or 8. That's where she was at, at about 7 before that debate performance. She shoots up to 15, 16 points, peaks, and then she begins uh, going back down. She's stabilized at her long-term average. You can see straight lines beginning. The, the only person who has bucked that trend, and so she is the anti-Biden, is Elizabeth Warren who happens to be in second place now. She's managed to get up to the same point at which Bernie Sanders is, which is between the 15 and 20 point marker. This is the, this is the second tier candidates thing. You can literally look. You can see people begin to filter out. We saw this in 2016. Biden is Donald Trump riding at the top. Again, people saying, well, he's got a low ceiling. No, he's got a high floor. He hasn't gone below. The lowest point he's ever been at is 26 points. The lowest point Biden has ever been at in the aggregate is higher than any single polling result for any other candidate at any other point in the field. He's the front runner. You then have Elizabeth Warren rising up to Sanders. She, she and Kamala and Buttigieg sort of split. Kamala goes down with Buttigieg. They're, they're now the bottom tier of viability. And Warren and Bernie Sanders form that sort of missing link between those that are on the low end but technically viable, although they're not going to win, than those at the top, which is one person, Joe Biden. At this point, I would give an 80% chance that Joe Biden becomes the nominee. 
I would put it higher, but we have another debate to go through, and we always have time for Joe Biden to destroy his own campaign. Biden is his own worst enemy. The thing is that if, if people perceive him as electable, little gaffes he can now get away with. He's managed to make all sorts of little mistakes. People keep forgiving him for him. Who does that remind you of? Donald Trump. Some of the things that Donald Trump said and did were A-B testing, but ultimately boiled down to him making mistakes in the 2016 primary. He turned him around into strengths. Now, Biden is not so good at this, but look at who his opponents are. Elizabeth Warren, fundamentally, if, if I'm not a complete leftist and I'm worried at all about electability, I'm not going to back Elizabeth Warren. She's gone far, far left. She's literally for decriminalizing illegal aliens uh, you know, crossing the border. Essentially, under Warren's plan, you do realize any person in the world could fly to Mexico, walk across the border, and it would not be illegal. There would be no process for removal. Anybody could come to this country and be granted conditional residency as, so, as long as they're capable physically of entering the country. That is essentially what Elizabeth Warren has proposed. This is not normal politics, not by a long shot. It is so far outside of the Overton window that there's no dragging it over to kind of overlap. It's not like Trump's mild populism, which is what I talked about in 2015. In that election, what Trump was proposing was seen as out there, but ultimately it wasn't that far out there. The idea of deporting people who commit crimes is not out there. It only seems so if you think Obama's normal. The idea of building a wall on the southern border was openly professed and accepted by both parties until very, very recently. It's not that out there. The idea of make America great again, America first, jobs, 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 that's, that's not abnormal. The idea of tax reform is not abnormal. Nothing he proposed is draconian or fascistic in any way. The handful of proposals or things that he ever has done that have been more out there, like the Syria strikes, eh, he did that to great applause, including among Democrats. That's really the story. The story of Trump is one of him being cast off is really far out there because he makes mean tweets. That's really the only thing that he does that's out there at this point. Biden doesn't have the ability to do that. But then again, it doesn't seem to be helping his opponents. Maybe it's because they're sellouts. Kamala Harris is a sellout. The reason Kamala Harris is falling is because as soon as she became well-known, people said, oh, she did so well at the debates. But then they were immediately confronted. This is the internet in action. They were confronted by people who said, oh, yeah, yeah, she did well at the debate, but look, X, Y, and Z. Here's her prosecutorial record. Here's, what is his name, Willie Brown or whatever it is, the person she was technically committing bigamy with. By the way, that's a little bit of a complicated issue. No, she didn't sleep her way into power, but yes, she did technically commit bigamy with a man. Um, or adultery or whatever. She technically was with a married man, although he was separated kind of at the time. It's a little bit a little bit of an odd issue, but I mean, she's a shifty character. She's definitely dubious. Putting away inner city black citizens for uh, marijuana possession and then using them as slave labor within the prison system. Wonderful, Kamala. See, the problem is that's destroyed your campaign. She should drop out. She's not going to become the nominee. She's not going to be chosen as a running mate. Um, her support has dwindled off too far. If I had to guess, I'd say Joe Biden would pick Buttigieg. And he'd be smart, by the way, to do so. Someone who's young, gay, that helps, certainly. <laughs> with, soli with solidifying the wedge issue vote, uh, he's well-spoken. He'd, he'd probably win against Pence at the, the vice presidential debate. Yeah, I, my money would be on Buttigieg in that one. Although Trump would run rings around Biden and end up winning, uh, Buttigieg would set himself up well. Buddy Geek is set up for a future presidential run, make no mistake about it, that will make this one look non-viable. Buddy Geek is setting himself up. Tulsi Gabbard, by the way, is also doing that. The steps that she's taking are for the future, not for the present. These two young individuals, they're both in their late 30s, they're not that much older than me. These individuals are not currently in the running to become president of the United States. They're in the run-up to become a future contender for the presidency or to go into a further career within local or state politics, maybe get into the, into the Senate. They can do anything they want. They're still, you know, they're not even quite middle-aged yet by politician standards. Middle-aged for a politician is like 50. Look at Strom Thurmond. Uh, yeah. Google Strom Thurmond and ask yourself if we need uh, age limits on people within government. But yeah, as far as the poll analysis goes, Biden remains front runner. Harris continues her slump. She's sort of leveled out now, but she's barely ahead of Buttigieg. I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up ahead of her at some point. If he rises up just a little bit more, he can. He needs a couple points in the aggregate. 
Warren has risen up to become about equal with Bernie Sanders and is arguably slightly ahead. But between the two of them, all they're doing is strangling each other. I can look at a time here when, based on Bernie's loss, Biden was riding in the low 40s. If that were to happen now, let's say if, if you look at Biden and Sanders visually on this, you will see there is a huge inversion, which means that if Biden loses support, Sanders is grabbing it up. If Sanders loses support, Biden is grabbing it up. Who's not affected? Elizabeth Warren. You know whose support she's gobbling? Kamala Harris. She's gobbling up the proportion of Kamala Harris's voters, and, and that's basically done right now, which is why they've both leveled out. Here's the secret. Those extra Kamala voters were the Yas Queen Slay voters. That roughly four or five points that Warren has gained and Kamala has lost, those are the strong, empowered female voters. And they've all gone to Elizabeth Warren. Kamala Harris has been left right back where she started, which is between seven and eight points. Visual representation proves it. Look at it. Look at the chart on RCP, link in the description. You can find extremely strong correlations in the movement of polling. And if you can analyze this, you can tell where the polls will continue to go because you can get a sense of what proportion of people are giving value to certain things. You get five, six percent of the Democratic electorate cares that the, the candidate has a vagina. They've all gone to Elizabeth Warren because they think she's more viable, which is their second goal. Viable candidate must be able to win, as opposed to Kamala Harris. It's as simple as that. Bernie Sanders has slumped. He's lost some of his long-term support to Joe Biden. But his long-term floor is probably around 12 to 15 no, percent. That's not bad. He'll stick it in. And he'll keep Elizabeth Warren from ever rising up and being a viable contender for Biden. The only wild card at this point is the New Hampshire poll from Gravis showing Sanders possibly winning New Hampshire. If he wins New Hampshire, even if Biden manages to snag a win in Iowa, which is by no means necessarily a guarantee, even if Biden gets that and goes into New Hampshire, he might lose that state and end up not becoming nominee because Sanders grabs it out from under him. If Sanders can do that, if he can then become viable in either South Carolina or Nevada, he has the clout to be able to drag things out long past Super Tuesday. If, however, Biden manages to snag New Hampshire, even by a few votes, Bernie Sanders is no longer viable. He has to win New Hampshire. That's our wild card. Our first, the first real big marker in this race won't even be Iowa. Because Iowa is a free-for-all at the moment. Sanders has 25,000 volunteers. Biden's the front runner. He's got all the big corporate money. Elizabeth Warren has risen up. She could be viable there, potentially win. It's not Iowa. We have to look at New Hampshire. Because that's when Biden has at least a chance to knock out one of the other main candidates. Sanders losing New Hampshire, the big news of the next day won't even be about who won it. It'll be about who lost it. That's about all. Peace out.